Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I am super excited because today is a book birthday for Jonathan Mayberry. And many of you are very familiar with Jonathan, as well as Scott Sigler, who is joining him in conversation today. And yes, Jonathan gave you a little Vanna White circular showing <laughs> right there. Uh -huh. But we are here to celebrate his horror novel, Ink, which, as the name does imply, has to do with tattoos and the memories of souls on bodies and whatnot. And I'm not going to give anything away, but I feel like that sentence is already really freaking cool and just makes you want to learn more of, like, tattoos fading, tattoos not, really creepy things, eating, like, souls and energy and darkness, and it's just... It's awesome. You're in yep. for a treat tonight. And um, Scott, I believe your latest thing too, it was Aliens Phalanx, which we'd had an awesome pre-order campaign for earlier. Yes. So if you're interested in either one of those books, Mysterious is really, really, really lucky that we have both of these as local authors and they can sign in personalized books for you. And of course, the best way to support an author and to keep more books coming from that author your way is to buy those books. And if you can get it signed in personalized, it's even better. Right, exactly. I so, I will now do the a white portion very quickly and then pass it off to Scott. If you have any questions for our authors, make sure right down below where it says, ask a question that you, as it would imply, ask a question for our authors there. They're going to have a little discussion and then they will move into the questions. And then also a button will appear that will say, buy book. And that is where you can go and buy all of their books. Scott, I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to you and I will see you guys at the yeah. end of the Wonderful. And just because the link says buy book, it is in English. It's not in Russian, but I'm sure they can get you the Russian copy if you want. Hello, everyone. Welcome, Jonathan. How are you doing this evening? Doing really well, despite the uh, suntan or sunburn, rather. I'm doing great. <laughs> You'll notice how pale I am, everybody. That's because uh, the sun and I are not are not pals. My people do not handle the heat all that well. Jonathan, book birthday. I know you have you have 18,000 novels out. And now it's 18,001, but still, this is a pretty special day when your book is actually officially out in the market. How's it feel? Oh, it feels great. This is one of those books that I have been in love with since I came up with the idea. And mm -hmm. I've been, you know, I loved writing it. I loved everything. And now that it's out, I you know, actually feel like I should give it a slice of cake. I'm not sure how it would be a slice of cake, but... You know, maybe it is International Bread Day. Give it a slice of bread. Call it even. It, it works out very well. I'm okay with that. You in the chat room who are not familiar with this book, Jonathan, would you? I will read the synopsis in my movie, my bad movie guy voice, so people okay. can speed. Are you ready? Tattoo artist Patty Cakes has her dead daughter's face tattooed on the back of her hand. Day by day, it begins to fade, taking with it all of Patty's memories of her daughter. All she has left is the certain knowledge that she has forgotten her lost child. The awareness of that loss is tearing her apart. Monk Edison is a private investigator whose skin is covered with the tattooed faces of murder victims. He is a predator who hunts for killers, and the ghosts of all those dead people haunt his life. Some of those faces have begun to fade, too, destroying the very souls of the dead. All through the town of Pine Deep, people are having their most precious memories stolen. The monster seems to target the lonely, the disenfranchised, the people who need memories to anchor them to this world. Something is out there. Something cruel and evil is feeding on the memories, erasing them from the hearts and minds of people like Patty and Monk and others. Ink is the story of you lonely, damaged people hunting for a memory thief. When all you have are memories, there is no greater horror than forgetting. That sounds pretty good to me. I think that sounds like a good book. I think I'll go read it. Yeah. <laughs> now, um, I, I'm excited by this, of course, because it, it does bring us back to your fictitious environment of Pine Deep. So tell us a little bit about Pine Deep and, and the number of stories you have set there. So um, Pine Deep is loosely based on a real, a real town called New Hope, Pennsylvania, which is one of the older towns in Pennsylvania. It goes back to you know pre-colonial times. And... Um, was known for years as the most haunted town in America. Um, and that, that's kind of a neat distinction to have. Savannah, Georgia, I think is currently the most haunted town in America, but Pine, uh, New Hope had that reputation. And I, I wanted to do stories set in a town where, you know, that haunting, haunted history was celebrated. So they built their tourism industry around it and, and so on. And my first novels, actually a trilogy of novels uh, called the Pine Deep Trilogy, um, Ghost Road Blues, Dead Man's Song, Bad Moon Rising are set in that town. 
um, on Halloween as there's a big Halloween festival. And it turns out the town is actually more haunted or the most haunted town in America. And that's not a great thing for the people who live there. So that was how my fiction career got started. And that was only 14 years ago. That first book came out. It's been a really busy 14 years. Yeah. Ink is set in the same town, you know, 15 years later. Um, and it's, even though there are some characters from the original story there, the plot does not involve the events of that trilogy. It's a standalone novel. It's just there. It, it, the main characters are characters from other books. So it's, it's kind of a weird hybrid of standalone. So, you know, Ink deals with Patty and Monk as the main characters, but the characters from the Pine Deep trilogy are supporting characters. And then there's some new people in it as well. And the town of Pine Deep is its own yeah. character as well. Yeah, it has a, a, a very much a personality. And I've always been a fan of, of fiction that gives location a sense of a of, of person, you know, a, a sense of personality. And Pine Deep, you know, it has a lot of negativity to it, but there's also some positive influences very on, on different supernatural levels. There are some uh, these things called nightbirds that that follow around different characters, and they're the ones who kind of warn of the coming disaster. Um, and uh, they appear in a number of my books, including the, the latest Joe Ledger novel I just did. The nightbirds are in that as well, because that has a supernatural element to it. And that's that's part of what you do. You kind of uh, interlink the stories, even the standalone stories. You've got some characters moving around, some themes moving around, moving the nightbirds from place to place. Is that is that because you can't leave these characters alone or are there are there just kind of ghostly echoes out there that need to be connect need to be there to connect things a bit, a bit of all that plus um advice i got so in 2007 i went to the edgar awards in new york and uh, it was the, it was the year that stephen king was being inducted as grandmaster mm -hmm. i went up sitting with him and his wife and, and their sons for for quite a while before the whole thing started just you know talking to the king for a while and one of the things um, King kept saying to me, he kept calling me kid, by the way. And I'm, you know, <laughs> I was 49 at the time. So, but, you know, if he wants to call, if he wanted to call me Bambi, he could do that, you know, Stephen King. But he said, you know, one of the things that his fans really dig, his constant readers, is the fact that characters from different stories wander into other tales, not in a way that makes it required that you read the other books. Mm -hmm. But if you have, that's another level that the, the readers um, enjoy. But also, he feels he felt it brought along some of the magic from those other stories. And so I started doing it. Um, and I, you know, I started off by actually adding real people from the real world to my book. And in, in the third Pine Deep book, there's a whole bunch of people from the horror community that, that are in that book. I'll talk mm -hmm. about that in a sec. But from then on, I started bringing characters from um, different books into different short stories, novels, even some of my comics because there is the Mayberry verse, you know, it's, it's that weird world inside the writer's head. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I did mention that the, the celebrities that are in, in dark, uh, bad Moon rising. I had, because of the convention circuit, I'd gotten to know a bunch of folks in the horror industry and, and told them what I was writing, that it was, you know, I wanted to do this book and could I write them into the book? And, uh, all of them said, yes. So, uh, in, in bad Moon rising, you have Ken Fury, star of Dawn of the dead is in it. Um, Scream Queens, uh, Brink Stevens and Debbie Rashan, uh, screenwriter, Steven Susco, who wrote the grudge, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, gun, James Gunn, who up, up to that point had done Slither and the remake of the Dawn of the dead Okay. Uh, before he did the Avengers, uh, or did, did some of the other films, the, um, uh, guardians of the galaxy, uh, Joe Bob Briggs is in there. There's a whole bunch of celebrities, uh, Tom Savini, and it was fun giving them all plot you know, like, like like really important action scenes within that story. And um, how many of them did you kill? To be honest. Actually, I didn't kill any of the celebs at their request. I, I offered them the opportunity to die horribly. And they're like, nah, <laughs> I have killed celebs in other books though. Do you know the comedian Tom Segura? Yeah. Yeah. So he won a contest to be killed off in one of my zombie novels. Awesome. <laughs> and uh, so he's doing stand up in fall of uh, fall of night and gets eaten by zombies while doing stand-up. Were you able to get actual original stand-up for him, like contextual with the book? No, no, he did. Uh, that was something his agent wouldn't wouldn't allow. Uh, him to do. But so he's about to do stand-up, and he's waiting for someone else to finish the opening act when the zombies attack. And but, <laughs> but it was cool. And he, and at some of his concerts, you know, he'd be saying, "Oh, and by the way, I, zombies freaking ate me." You know, and I'd show the book. That was kind of cool. 
Now you uh, you're into the spooky stuff, and you mentioned Stephen King, and that is a gateway drug for a lot of horror authors, myself included. Was was Stephen King or another author what got you into the spooky stuff, or was it something else? No, actually, my grandmother got me into the spooky stuff. Mm. If you can imagine Luna Lovegood uh, from the Harry Potter books as an old lady, that's mm-hmm. my grandmother. She believed in everything. Zombies, werewolves, vampires, ghosts, everything. And she was about a million years old anyway. Um, and um, so she got me into all things. She got me actually into folklore first, supernatural okay. folklore. And then from there, I kind of migrated over to the fiction. Um, and I got involved in horror fiction when I met, I, I had a chance to meet and become mentored by Ray Bradbury and Richard Matheson when I was a teenager. Mm-hmm. And they kept giving me horror books to read first their own and then other people. So I, I kind of had a lot of powerful influences in my life, pushing me toward the horror. Um, and I just fell in love with it, both the, the folklore and the, and the fiction of it. I f- absolutely fell in love with it. Not to deviate too far from ink, but uh, at 14, those are some pretty powerful connections. I mean, there's uh, now I'm old enough to now say there's younger people in the room who might not understand, but those were, were giant names. How did you wind up getting that uh, mentorship? Well, and it's funny because that does tie to ink because the book is dedicated to the person who introduced me to them. Awesome. Um, Abigail Smith was my libra- the librarian in my middle school. And um, they, I had a, it's in the common odd, odd middle school, I had a really low academic standard. And I was, since I was actually doing homework, I was ruining the curve for other kids. <laughs> so they, they took me out of regular classes and put me in the library for three years. Hmm. So I was doing my, I got to come out for gym and math class and that was it. Um, so she was the secretary for two clubs of professional writers, one that met in Philly, Sprague de Camp and, and that crew who were doing the Conan stories, uh, oh. the, you know, doing all the sword and sorcery stuff. But there was also a group that met in New York on kind of, uh, uh, not a regular basis, but regular enough. Uh, it was at a publisher's penthouse, whichever, whichever authors were in town to launch a book or for an event would, would descend on his place for a party. And, and she would bring me up to these parties. And I got to meet, the Matheson and Bradbury. When I first met Bradbury, I didn't know who he was. And she's like, and this is Ray Bradbury. And I'm like, oh, oh, are you a writer too? <laughs> Harlan Ellison, who was standing behind him, lost his shit. At that point. <laughs> totally. He's crying, laughing. And Bradbury's like, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've, uh, I've taken a swing at it once or twice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Very, very modest. I like it. So uh, it's funny that does the dedication is to the person who got you into this, which gets us back to ink. Um, now there's a, some new territory for you in this. And I know you always do a ton of research on your books. Can you tell us a little bit about the research for ink? Yeah, I, uh, I don't have tattoos myself, but I've always been fascinated by certain types of tattoos. The ones where there is an important memory or meaning attached to it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, um, I, I started doing research. I, I interviewed, I used social media, um, Instagram and, and Facebook and Twitter to invite people who have tattoos to reach out to me. And I, I created a question set and interviewed them about why they got the tattoo, what the meaning was, has that meaning changed, how people uh, reacted to the tattoos and so on, why they got certain types of tattoos, like a full sleeve as opposed to a single image. Mm-hmm. And at, in doing that research, it kind of opened my eyes up to what the world of you know skin art is all about, why people you know treasure it so much. And um, a lot of the research influenced, I already had a plot idea, but by doing the research, it influenced a lot of the elements that are in the story. And in fact, um, some of the anecdotes that some of the characters, you know, tell in the story about why they got um, uh, certain um, tattoos and what they meant are from those interviews, directly from those interviews. And that, that was a lot of fun, but it was it was fascinating. And I, I may actually get a tattoo at some point. I haven't really decided. Well, that was my next question. Um, since you already said you didn't get one for research for this, if you were to get one today, what would it be and why? Um, well, if I got one today, it would probably be a different reason than what I, I would get if it was next year. Um, my plan has always been if a movie is made out of one of my books, mm-hmm. I will get a tattoo tied to that book or that movie. And we have a, you know, I have a movie in development now. We're at the second draft of the script. Um, I have a couple other projects where we're getting, looks like we're getting pretty close. So including the character Monk Addison from Inc., who's been optioned for, for film or TV by a couple of Hollywood producers. Okay. He's covered in, in faces, you know, pale white faces that, that are the images of dead people. I might actually get a, a, an image of um, like one of those faces just on me um, to to tie it to that because Monk has become one of my favorite characters. 
Now we've been friends for a while, but I, I gotta, I gotta call potential BS on this one. You're waiting for a movie, but you had a whole Netflix series about one of your books that doesn't merit a tattoo. No, it doesn't because they're the, the <laughs> I wasn't involved in the creative process of that show. Okay. And everything else I've done, everything else is under option. Now I'm, I'm uh, executive producer on, so I will actually be part of the creative process. Okay. So that makes me feel, it gives me more agency over it. And therefore it's more attractive for me to get something like a tattoo to, to link me to it. All right. All right. We'll allow it. We've, we've consulted the jury. We will allow it. Although if I, if I get a Netflix show, I'm getting ink on that. So yeah, you've got sure. me beat there. Um, now of course the audiobook for this is narrated by Ray Porter, I believe. Yes. Yes. Ray Porter is, does, uh, he does my book Earthcore, my book coming out, Mount Fitzroy. It's out December 3rd on audible. Um, mm -hmm. he's such an amazing talent. He's dark side in the justice league. He's done all, so many things. Um, it's, it's, it's got to, even when you know, you're probably going to get Ray to get Ray for rank had to be kind of exciting because of what he can do. Was it, was it cool? It, it was. In fact, um, much as I love the, the narrator who did the, the pie deep novels, originally Tom Weiner. I mean, he's fantastic. He did a good job on those. Yeah. He, he did great job on it. I mean, it's fantastic. Um, but when I write, I often hear Ray's voice in my head, which is <laughs> somewhat freaky. And I think he may have magical powers. I'm not sure. But I, I do love, you know, the way he interprets my work. He's done all the Joe Ledger books. Um, uh, he's done books in the Rotten Ruin series, books in the Dead of Night series. Uh, I don't know how many short stories of mine he's done. You know, we've we've worked on at least thirty projects together. Okay. And um, so when the, when they were asking me, McMillan Audio was asking me who they who I wanted for for ink. I said it's got to be Ray Porter, and, and I, I made it. You know, it has to be Ray Porter, or I don't want the audiobook. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I'm not at the point in my career where I can insist a little bit, not mm -hmm. being a jerk, but just say, this is what I want. Um, and so he does most of my stuff that has a male protagonist, a main protagonist. Um, a couple of times, like like with um, Bewilderness, a project I have coming up for Audible, we, we, we have a woman narrating it because all three main characters in that story are female. Okay. So, but anything else, you know, if I have say over, it's going to be Ray. And then uh, tell me more about the tell me about the the collection of Pine Deep stories. So that's another setting that's darkness on the edge of town. Yeah. That what is that all about? Well, uh, when I wrote the the trilogy, I left a couple of threads deliberately unresolved because I I wanted more stories to tell. The main main threat was resolved, but just in real life, as in real life, when something some event happens, it doesn't mean everything is a completely clean ending. And I because I don't like totally tidy endings. I never did. So I wanted to write some short stories and I, I, you know, for different magazines or anthologies, I would write Pine Deep stories. And I, when I had enough of them, I, you know, my agent approached um, Blackstone Audio to do a collection. And we did uh, um, f four reprints and then one original story that actually ties up one of the more important threads from the trilogy. So it actually gives closure to that trilogy and uh, it's still available on audio and it's read by Ray Porter and it's, it's one of my, it, one of my favorite collections of short stories. And so do you have a preferred female narrator as well? Cause if it, obviously if it's a male narrated, you want to go to Ray, do you have someone in particular that you like, or are you still kind of finding your muse in that, in that? Well, I've, I've worked with a number of female readers. Like right now, Shana Small was reading Bewilderness and she's, she's brilliant. She's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And the reason we picked her by the way is uh, the, ma the main character is mixed race. So we wanted an actress reading it who was mixed race. Uh, just kind of essentially the embodiment of that character. And of the three audition um, uh, files, aud audio files that I was given, she's hers was the one that just stood out for me. Just absolutely stood out for me. But I've worked mostly with Emma Galvin and Hilary Huber um, for female audio readers. Emma Galvin did... Um, uh, my Dana Scully, you know, origin of of, of the X Files character Dana Scully novel uh, called Devil's Advocate, um, and she did um, Glimpse, which was yeah. which actually introduced Monk Addison, and Hillary Huber did the X Files audiobook series um, for the three anthologies I did, and re and and she she was the Scully, and Bronson Pinchot was actually the uh, the Mulder character. Mm -hmm. He was amazing. And then Hillary recently did um, uh, the female voices in uh, Don't Turn Out the Lights, an anthology I edited 
for the Horror Writers Association that was a tribute to Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. She's mm -hmm. amazing. So Emma Galvin and Hillary are the two I've worked with the most. Now, going after uh, a narrator who is mixed race, who possibly can empathize uh, better with the character, perhaps bring the character better to life. Were there any elements of ink that involved uh, groups that you are not intimately familiar with yourself? Like, okay, here's some characters that I don't really know a lot about. I'm going to figure out how to properly portray this. Yeah, and that was a, that was an important thing in the research of this. Um, I'm a straight white guy, so mm -hmm. I have a lot of friends who are in the LGBTQT community but I'm not in that community. So anything I would write without doing research would be in danger of being a cliche version of the characters written from the point of view of a white guy, white straight, straight white guy. So mm -hmm. I, I did interviews with, with women who were, because um, there are two characters, there's, there's a relationship in the book between a, um, a married woman who is, who is, is finally embracing the fact that she's at least bisexual and mm -hmm. she wants to explore that and never has. And a character who, um, after having been married, got divorced because she identified, she, uh, she finally identified as, as as a lesbian, not as bi. And they get into a relationship. Both of those experiences are completely outside of my experience. So I interviewed women who were, you know, who fit those models, those characters, and got their insight and also allowed them to read some of the scenes that I wrote to make sure that, again, I was not writing any version of a cliche. I hate writing cliche characters. Right. I know you do too. I you know we there's an integrity that writers have with our characters. We want them to be as real as possible. And um it's it's it incumbent on a writer to to go the extra mile and do that research. And I and I've already heard from some people who have been reading the book who said that those characters read in fact I even had somebody ask me today if I was gay. And I'm like, no I'm not. And they say, well that's weird because the characters in the in the book, you know, mm -hmm. resonate with that. And I'm like well, they're female gay characters, and I'm not a. Even if I was gay, I'm not a lesbian. So it doesn't mean a gay man could write a lesbian character. There's a very complicated Venn diagram going on here. There, there is. There is a lot. There's a lot. Uh, so, so I, I I did my research and and mm -hmm. uh, you know feel that I did justice to those characters in a way that I want to be able to revisit those characters in in the future. So you're you're doing it. Get inspiration for a character. You're doing your due diligence to make sure that is as as accurate and represent representative as it can be. Did that aspect of the writing push you into any areas that you just hadn't written in before? And like, oh, like holy cow! After doing this for all these years, now this is so exciting. I've never written this concept or this angle before. Yeah, in fact, it it, uh, it allowed me to, to delve into the, into the process of um of, of a woman breaking free of the even though it's 21st century of, of the, the conventional uh, viewpoint that a woman should grow up, get married, even if she got, has a career, get married, have kids, you know, be in a relationship, you know, straight uh, heterosexual relationship. And I wanted to explore what happens when somebody realizes, you know, they did, they got married, they went through all that because they felt the obligation or were trained or conditioned to do it. But as they got older and, and more, more insightful, they realized that it is not who they are. Mm -hmm. And that that sense of self awareness and the step toward personal agency is something I have never written about with with characters who were who were not of of my gender orientation, and that really opened my eyes up. Um, I've always felt you know I've always been an ally to the LGBTQ uh, T community, but this gave me more of an insight than I had before. So the research actually benefited me uh, personally, but also allowed me to write more honestly with those characters. Let's get back. Let's go back to Monk for a minute. Monk's character in great character from from Glimpse, and as a private investigator, as a, as an author, you can do anything you want with a private investigator class. They can have any 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 procedure, any way you want to go about it, because so few people can go back and fact check how private investigation actually works, especially when you watch a lot of PIs on TV. Uh, how, how do we get to learn more about his investigative process in Ink? Um. A little bit. He does a little bit of investigation in this, but uh, um, his actual, the, there are four short stories about Monk that will eventually be their own audio book or uh, collection. But um, uh, he's mostly a skip tracer. That That's his main gig. Okay. Uh, somebody who's who's run out on, on, on bail and he's going after those people. But really the the, process, the part of his process that, that fills or that feeds into my stories is not actually not that part of his job. It's this, this calling he has where if somebody has been murdered um, by someone who is likely to continue committing murders, 
the mm -hmm. ghost of the murdered person comes to him and, you know, essentially engages his services to stop the killer, not in revenge, but literally to prevent them from doing more murders. And um, he takes some blood from the crime scene, has it mixed with tattoo ink and has the murdered mm -hmm. victim's face tattooed on his body. And as soon as the tattoo is complete, he's able to relive their murder from their perspective and cap capture whatever clues he can from what the, the victim perceived. And then goes out and finds the guy and usually kills him. You know, it usually ends badly for the bad guy. Mm -hmm. um, but the downside is even though that person, the bad guy is taken off the board, the ghost having done this to prevent other murders, there's a negative cost to it. They are now trapped with him. They haunt him the rest of their life, rest of his life. Mm -hmm. so like every night he goes to bed, there are dozens of ghosts around his bed. Some of them are screamers, you know, some, oh. some are, are, are trapped in the moment of their death. And so he's, he's a pretty troubled individual and he's covered, you know, all over, except for his face, all over with, with faces of dead people. So we see that process happen. We see that part of his, his job. Does he, does he continue to be a, a bristly individual in ink as he has been he's, in other books? He's, he's bristly. Yeah. But also <laughs> because it's more um, like there's more of him um, in different types of emotional situations in this where he actually, you know, has a, has a, a, a meet, meet someone who becomes a lover for him. We see a, a much softer side of him, but when he's up against either the bad guys or even some of the other um like the cop in the town who's from Pine, uh, original trilogy, there is definitely an immediate antagonism. Okay. The two of them. And it's fun to write that too, because um, they're both sarcastic, both tough, and they, they dislike each other immediately. And that's, that's fun to write. Was it, were there any particular characters from Pine Deep uh, that when you came back to the, when you moved back to town, so to speak, uh, that you were like, Oh gosh, I can't wait. Can't wait to write this person again. Or, or secondary question did you find that you have changed and your relationship with that character is no longer what it once was? Yeah. Which is why I didn't want the characters to be who they were 14 years ago in the story. They've evolved as well. So mm -hmm. uh, like the main character of Crow, um, Malcolm Crow, he's the, the, town, the, the, the police chief in the town. In the original book, he was a, you know, a recovering alcoholic who had lost his job in the police force, owned a craft shop. And he was, you know, it's basically a schlub trying to put his life together. Now he's back being the chief of police and he's, he's tougher and much more confident, but also older and carries the scars, you know, from what happened. The biggest evolution of a character is Mike Sweeney, who was 14 years old in the Pine Deep novel. Sure. He was an abused 14 year old kid. And now he's a, he's a, a sergeant in the police department and he's six foot, I forget how old, how the six foot eight or something. He's, he's really gigantic and powerful and, very troubled um, because of what he went through and what his nature is now. And um, there's a lot of fun writing him. So when I was knew I was going back to Pine Deep, there were four characters I wanted to bring from the, from the Pine Deep, the original trilogy, Crow, Mike Sweeney, Crow's wife, Val. And there's a very strange supernatural character named Mr. Pockets. And um, I, I wanted to put him in a couple of scenes as well. So I did. And were there, did, did any of them, resonate with you like you did you wind up with a favorite of your children out of this out of the old guard crow is probably going to always be one of my favorite characters um mm -hmm. the reason i i like him actually him and mike he and mike um the reason i like both of those characters i i was a pretty badly abused kid and mm -hmm. um i had martial arts to, to you know to go to to help me become stronger and eventually stop this cycle of abuse in my household um but i wanted to explore in fiction that dynamic from a couple different perspectives. So Mike Sweeney, as a kid in the original Pine Deep novels, was the, was the version of me that was still undergoing the abuse and had reached that point where he realized that, that he will outlive and outlast the abuser, which is an incredible moment for an abused person that you realize that, that this person is older and when I'm older, they're going to be much older. I will, you know, I will be able to overcome them. And to see him as an adult, that, that, that arc was really important for me. And Crow, Crow was what what might have happened to me if I hadn't had martial arts. You know, he didn't. He had. He got into martial arts later, but he also got into drinking, which I never did. I was never an alcoholic. So I wanted to explore what my life would have been if I had become a substance abuser. Same basic personality, but on a on a self destructive trend. So mm -hmm. I was able to explore both of those dynamics, both in the original story, and then roll forward fourteen years later to see what became of those characters 
once they had defeated the monster of their original lives. And it's such a, we're, we're, we're in a different world now. Now we're, uh, we got about 30 minutes left. If you guys have any questions in the chat room, I'll be happy to, to move those over to Jonathan. But with the amount of re you're well known for how much research you do and how in depth you go. Um, now that you can't sit down face to face with people, has, is that an issue that changes things or have you always been kind of a distance researcher and is this just business as usual for you? Um, I, I do research any way that's, that's convenient. Cause I was, I went to journalism school. So I was trained as an interviewer for, you know, I was going to be a newspaper reporter. Probably okay. the only thing in writing I have not done is actually write for a newspaper. But, um, I used to do a lot of phone interviews. I used to do person in-person interviews. I like doing interviews right now through email because I don't have to transcribe. And mm -hmm. people, if you're doing a face-to-face -face interview with somebody, as people get enthused about a subject, they'll often have another idea and they interrupt themselves and they don't actually finish complete sentences. They don't okay, always give okay. you full information. Whereas in an email interview, they will. So it gives me a, a more full-bodied version of what they have to say. And I can do follow-ups. But I also do sometimes where I'll get on a Zoom chat with three or four people and we'll, we'll talk about something and, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll make some notes as I'm as I'm doing that. Um, I'll interview people any way I can. But, you know, we're in the age of social media. It's easy to talk to people. And sure. I'm naturally gregarious, so I can I can get a conversation going and keep it going. Uh, Robert Ricks is asking questions. Chat. He may have joined a little late, but he's asking, does this story of a similar breakdown like the books of blood? Is it a bunch of stories weaved together the main story plot or just a single story? So maybe you could quickly recap this single story and how it incorporates into the rest of the. Yeah, the it's, it's, world. it's a single narrative, but with an ensemble cast. So there's a shifting point of view. Okay. You know, Monk Addison is the main character, but we, but, uh, you also have Pat, the tattoo artist, Patty cakes. You have crow Mike, uh, Crow and Mike as supporting characters. You have the the the, the two women, uh, Gail and Diana, uh, who are main characters, um, and then you have the villain, um, Owen Minor, who's main character. So I go into each point of view. So there's a lot of chapters, and I mm -hmm. keep jumping around, but it always defaults back to the main storyline of the investigation of un unusual deaths and the fact that some people seem to be missing tattoos and missing the memory of them. And that, that's something I've returned to, but it is, it is definitely a single novel, not a, not a collection of stories. So does the, I, I'm also a point of view switcher in all of my stories. Uh, is that, is that a stylistic thing you've gravitated towards or is, do you use multiple points of view is a particular, a particular tool of particular stories and you have other stories that are single points of view and how do you decide on that or can you not help it? Um, I, I, when, in, when possible, I use multiple point of view because I, I like a very well-rounded story. Um, my first novel, Ghost Red Blues, was all about shifting point of view, but it always defaulted back to Crow, you know, and Mike, which are the two main characters of that story. But I wanted to get inside, I, I started doing the multiple points of view really to get inside the head of the villain because I don't like a villain that, that is just villainous. Mm -hmm. I want a villain who has a reason for their worldview. Even if it's a corrupt reason, there's still a reason for it. So I started getting inside the head of the villains in the Pine Deep series, just as I get inside the head of Owen Minor in Inc., where we see the evolution of, of, of how they became who they are and why they became who they are and why their worldview allows them uh, to do what they do. Because nobody wakes up and says, hey, you're evil. You know, uh, th that, that, that isn't how it works. They have, we evolve into who we are. So by, by shifting point of view, I'm able to make them – uh, three-dimensional characters rather than two-dimensional, you know, cartoon villains. And um, uh, the the times I, I do a single character point of view where I don't shift, like Mars One, um, my Night Sider series, uh, uh, the Dana Scully books, uh, Dana Scully book I did, that's usually because the editor has asked for a single character mm -hmm. point of view or because that's the best, you know, in, in rare case, it's the best way to tell the story. But most often I do shift point of view. Now I want to go back to your grandma for a little bit. Now you obviously with your nonfiction writing history and you still write nonfiction, you switch fiction, mm -hmm. nonfiction. But when you said what got you started was your grandma who was very superstitious. It sounds like very afraid of these things. And oh, no, no, she loved the thing. She believed she in it. Loved it. She, loved she it. believed them. Okay. Do you, and it doesn't seem like you believe these things are real. That I, I keep an open mind about some things. I don't believe in vampires and werewolves. Okay. But I, I do believe in the, the possibility of a larger world. Um, so I, you know, just like UFOs, I, I believe in the possibility of them. I have not met one. But I'm not going to say it's not 
there because I have no proof it's not there. Do you remember a time when you were a kid getting with your family member, getting you fascinated with this stuff, which is obviously not only carried with you all these years, but has become the focal point of your career and giving this, uh, this awesome artistic life. Was there a time when you were like, oh yeah, there's, there's vampires for sure. And then gradually got educated out of that. Yeah. When I was a kid, um, I was convinced there was a werewolf uh, that would reach for me through the, the banister, the, the, rail, the, the second floor railing. Mm -hmm. So I had to go up the stairs, leaning against the far wall to get up there. And if I got to the, the top of the stairs, the werewolf would go away. And I believed that for years. And um, also I had a boogeyman as a kid named Dr. Nine, who actually became the villain of my novel Glimpse. Mm -hmm. But and I don't know why his name was Doctor Nine, but that but <laughs> I would hear him coming toward my room. You know, probably analogous to my, the fact that I was abused as a kid. But I would hear him coming toward my room and, and know it was him, and that he was stealing from me my hope. And that became the basis for the novel Glimpse, a, a, a type of vampire that feeds on the very last bit of hope you have. Um, so I did I did believe as a kid, then. You know, I got so deep into the science, the folklore, the science associated with folklore, like <laughs> understanding why vampire beliefs are there, understanding why people believed in werewolves. There's been so many studies to explain these things um, that it, it changed my viewpoint that uh, to, to one that I, I believe most things that we call natural are not, but mm -hmm. there are some things mm -hmm. science hasn't yet explained or is possibly open to. So, you know, like, like paranormal things like like psychic abilities. We know every government has studied this. So there must be something there. I keep an open mind on that, you know. Uh, Robert and Oswald, plus my grandmother uh, was that? strange. Yeah. And well, my it, grandmother was strange. I, I, I don't want to dis disbelieve just because, you know, her beliefs are extreme. You, you, one often has to wonder some of the things our grandparents said, if they were just like, I'm going to mess with this kid's head. It's going to be so much fun. <laughs> I think she uh, did that with my sisters. I think she told me that what she believed. Oh, my parent, my, my dad and my brother used to mess with me all the time. And it took me forever to, to figure that out. Robert Osborne asks where, uh, the timeline where ink falls, where ink falls in the timeline with glimpse since monk Addison appears in both, but t ink is after glimpse. Yeah. It's about a year and a half after. Okay. Okay. And Dennis Crosby asks in terms of craft, did you find that you did something different from other novels in ink? Was there anything new you found in ink? Let's say other than the research into, uh, to LGBT and of those characters, was there anything stylistically or craft wise that you discovered or evolved in? Um, not particularly new. I mean, the style is, is, is a little bit of a hybrid of different things I've written, but, uh, probably the, the newest thing that I've been doing and I just did it in glimpse and I did it in this. Are, are, are my different takes on vampires because the, you know, Owen Miner is a kind of vampire, but he doesn't believe he doesn't feed on blood. He, he feeds on memories. Dr. Nine feeds on hope. So I wanted to explore, this is something I haven't explored before is the, the category of what's called the essential vampire, a vampire that feeds on an essence rather than some physical, like, like blood or other tissues. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, bo both the types of va vampires in, in glimpse and ink wouldn't call themselves vampires. And they aren't actually folkloric versions. They're my addition to the, the category of essential vampires. So that, you, are, you are somewhat of a, an, an authority or an expert on vampires. So I've with all of your nonfiction, five nonfiction books on the subject, five on vampires was, was that something that was compelling to you? Like, I love the concept of vampires, but I got to put my own, I got to put my own spin on it. Well, that's how I got involved in fiction in the first place. I had done a nonfiction book under a pen name, uh, the, the Vampire Slayer's Field Guide to the Undead, published in 1999, I think it was. Um, and uh, it was my my basically my my nod to my grandmother, who had long since passed. But it's a book she would have enjoyed because it told folklore, but also tried to present some of the science. And she liked the science, too. She liked to read anthropology as well as the, the folklore. So I did that. And then while, after I had done that for a couple of years, I kept looking for fiction in which they use the folklore versions of vampires and werewolves, but there was very little of it. And the folkloric versions of vampires and werewolves is radically different than the vampires and werewolves we see in movies. Like for example, um, in folklore, there's not one vampire in folklore that fears a cross. There's not one vampire in folklore that um, is killed by a stake through the heart. Uh, steak was never used to kill a vampire. It was used to hold it down, long steak, through the stomach, so its head can cut off in the ritual of exorcism and so on. 
there's there's not one werewolf subtype in any, anywhere in folklore that only turns into a werewolf in the three days of the full moon. Nowhere in folklore does a vampire or a werewolf have to bite you to turn you into one of them, and so on and so on. So I wanted to, to read stories where it's the folkloric versions of monsters, and there's many different types of vampires and werewolves, and I couldn't find much. So um, I decided to, to try my hand at, at a novel where people would encounter those types of monsters. And it was done as, a, as, as an experiment because I had never written fiction before. Mm -hmm. So this was my attempt to see if also I would like writing fiction. As it turns out, um, I mean, that book came out, my first novel came out in 2006. I am writing my 40th novel now. So clearly fiction was where I should have been all along. Um, with your, uh, with your expertise in the field and all your research, do you think that the movies that inspired those changed folkloric traditions, the biting, uh, the, the, the full moon, the three days, etc. do you ever get a gist that those were conscious storytelling decisions, some brilliant person making those movies like, you know, if we just simplified it down to this, this movie will kick ass. Sure. Or you think, did it just happen? Oops. No, no, I think a little bit of both. I mean, writers, when they write fiction, can change anything they want. That's why, we, mm -hmm. you know, science fiction isn't real science. We add that bit of fiction to make it uniquely our own. Well, they do it in horror fiction as well. A great example of this, though, was when Bram Stoker wrote Dracula. In the first third of the book, they establish how power, he establishes how powerful Dracula is. He gets to England with all that power. He just simply kill everyone. Mm -hmm. So he had to build in a limitation on him. So he built in the limitation that he could not enter a house unless invited. And that gave the heroes a chance to at least live long enough to realize the threat and begin to fight back. But that's mm -hmm. not in folklore. That's something the writer did because they really he really needed a way to limit the, the, the villain's power. And I see that with a lot of writers who do that sort of thing. Like with werewolves, they made it a curse rather than uh, a decision. In all werewolf folklore, it's it's somebody who chooses to become a werewolf. Okay. Um, none of it is because they're a curse. That curse never happened. But a curse makes the character more sympathetic because otherwise he's just a villain. Mm -hmm. So by somebody being cursed and acting outside of their nature in kind of a Jekyll and Hyde, because Jekyll and Hyde is really a werewolf story in structure, um, it, it allows the character to be sympathetic. So we feel bad for that character, even though they're a monster doing horrible things. And which, which kind of is ironic because my first New York Times bestseller was a novelization of the Wolfman. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually got a chance to explore that concept in that novel, um, going a little further into the folklore of it than, than was actually in the, the script I was adapting. Hmm. And uh, now if I, if I recall this correctly, Monk and Monk and Patty Cakes are not familiar with each other before Ink. Oh There's, no, they are. They're, they've known wow. each other since Vietnam. Oh God! What, what, been what, been them, what makes them relocate to Pine Deep? Well, first they're, they're living in, in Brooklyn, uh, in, in New York, you know, and then the the events of of um, a couple of the short stories that I've written and glimpsed kind of burn them out to New York. And mm -hmm. Patty really, she's going through a lot of emotional stuff anyway. So she wants to go to a place that she's always been happy with. And she's always been visiting uh, New Hope, Pennsylvania. It's a very artsy town. And so I just, or she was visiting Pine Deep, which is my stand-in for New Hope. So she decides to move there for a quieter life. And there's a, a fringe community that's, that's that's developing there. So, you know, she'll have people who would want the tattoos and so on. And Monk is it just feels he's uh, New York's used him up. And uh, he decides to move down there, too, because that way he can still do the skip tracing for bail bondsmen in, in Philadelphia and Doylestown. But it's but New York can can wear you out. Mm -hmm. And they wanted the quieter life. Of course, they moved to a town that's not all that quiet. <laughs> Oops. So where else do you go from here with Pine Deep? Is that uh, is that uh, are you always going to keep coming back to it? Or at some point, will you knock over the water tower and wipe the whole town out? So to speak? Well, it's funny because this is my my first Pine Deep novel since my original trilogy since uh, the third one came out. And my editor um, at uh, St. Martin's, we love the idea so much of having my own version of Derry or Castle Rock, like Stephen wow. King does. So if I do any more standalone novels, it's probably going to be in Pine Deep. And you figure it's a town that's known as the most haunted town in America. So it's kind of like the Hellmouth and Buffy. Any damn thing can happen there. It makes a great place to set a story where, you know, if you're in a town like that, if you have a little bit of, corruption or darkness in your soul, it's going to amplify that and bring out the worst of you in, in you. 
And that that gives me a lot of opportunity to to create new and interesting uh, villains. And I have some characters already in town who would who would uh, oppose it. I don't know if Monk would be the star of the next book. Possibly, certainly going to be a character in it. But uh, I will I will certainly be doing more Pine Deep novels. In fact, there's one that I'm just about to pitch, which is a Pine Deep novel set actually at the end of World War II, with a soldier returning um, from um, from Europe and finding out that that the town has you know some really bad things going on, mm-hmm. and um, he might be the only one tough enough to be able to to save his town. We have requests from the chat room. Uh, they need souvenir Pine Deep T-shirts. Are you uh, working on any merch from Pine Deep right now? Actually, we just got an offer for a um, a, a TV option on Pine Deep. Cool. So if that goes through, there will be a lot of Pine Deep merch. But I don't have any Pine Deep merch right now, except for the fact that leading up to this, people could, uh, if they bought they pre-ordered um, ink through one of the, the the links I put up. They get a set of temporary tattoos, and one of them is the sign for Pine Deep with mm-hmm. birds all over it. Um, that's the only merch right now. But I I do definitely want to want to get a uh, a Pine Deep T-shirt. I just need to come up with a logo for it. Sure. Um, David Lamb is asking if there'll ever be a collaboration between Scott Segler and Jonathan, but there there already is one. There already is a, a Joe Ledger. There is a crossover. Where yep. we have. Jonathan and I have been uh, kicking around the idea of a collaboration, but nothing, nothing really has settled in quite just yet. Yet, and and also with uh, with Peter Kleins, our buddy Peter Kleins. Yeah, uh, we're gonna we're gonna whenever we we all have a hole in our schedule, and I <laughs> laugh maniacally when I say that, uh, we'll probably put together something new and fun. But um, it's it's something we're talking about. Yeah, I, I kind of get the idea. Like it'll start with one of my. Um, evil research labs where genetics goes horribly wrong. And then Jonathan comes in and supernatural meets the genetics. And then Peter comes in and teleports it to a world of another dimension where there are lots of balloons. <laughs> Just yeah, that's, that's sounds like the back that. cover text. <laughs> that would work. All right. So uh, one of the thing about Pine Deep that is interesting to me is I'm in the middle of reading Joe Abercrombie's series in the middle of the trouble with peace. And, and I've been reading Joe long enough now where I'm watching his characters go from youth to uh you know to having a family to middle age to old and then we're getting generational stories the children of children of characters now becoming main characters is that a kind of thing you see happening in pine deep as well you're following these family trees these lineages oh, sure. so many messed up people does that is that how does that feel as a writer be like oh i i gave birth literally gave birth to this creature and now it's getting older yeah, actually, I uh, I plan to not only do stories with the next generation of Pine Deep characters, but also there is a story I want to write that's kind of in the middle between the original trilogy and this, where the character of Mike Sweeney's in high school, um, because I wanted to do something that's a very dark, very edgy uh, YA. But as far as as far as um, generational, absolutely intend to do that, and I'll be doing some of that with the Joe Ledger stories too. I have a, a, a something planned for the future where. It's the son of the adopted son of Mr. Church, uh, mm-hmm. who was introduced in the Dragon Factory, and um, I want to bring him in and give him some adventures too, because his birth father was Joseph Mengele. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> technically, a clone of an awkward Joseph Thanksgiving Church. dinner. He's like, yeah, "Oh, thank goodness for COVID, I don't got to meet that guy." That's fine. <laughs> oh, great. Now, if with all these books. Now we're going to get morbid. We're going to get morbid now with all these books and these longer. Uh, if not storylines, but these semi-permanent or permanent settings that you have set up, how how often do you have the thoughts that I have? Like, there's no way I'm going to live long enough to write all this stuff. And are you already at the point where you're, you've are you got a, a decision-making tree? Like, I know you get a job like, well, this will pay, so I'm doing this now. But like, if I don't get to this, it could be another 20 years. Who knows what could happen? Yeah. And the, I'm actually leaning toward doing um, novellas and short stories for things that I don't think... Uh, my agent would want to represent right now as the next novel, mm-hmm. uh, but I can slip in a novella, I can slip in a short story, and 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 revisit the characters, tell some of the story, move move the the chronology of that forward a little bit, um, without having to to put it into a novel at this point. So yeah, definitely doing a lot of that, and I'll be doing more of it. And we got about ten minutes left. Anybody has any more questions? Put them in there. But ink is out. It's uh, it's it sounds like a very exciting novel. It's nice to get back to there. There it is. Working as Vanna. What is, 
what is the next thing you have coming out and what is the most exciting new thing that you are starting up? Okay. So my next book coming out will be, um, the novel Relentless, which will be in July of next year, as far as I know. I, actually, I'm sorry, that's not even true. Um, next thing coming out is Bewilderness. It's a novel I wrote for Amazon for Audible. Mm -hmm. It's serialized into three chunks. It's a 97,000 word novel, but serialized into three chunks. It'll be an audio, uh, Audible exclusive, and it'll be free. People will be able to go and get all three sections for free, one in December 2nd, one in, in January, one in February. Um, so that, that'll be coming out next. Um, I know that the Joe Ledger novel Re Relentless will come out in June or July rather. Um, I'm writing Kagan the Dam, my first epic fantasy novel. And then I've got to write the next one right away because they want, they want to release those six months apart. Oof, I've, got to, I've got to write those two back to back and I'm having a blast with that. Mm -hmm. But I've got so much stuff in the pipeline and it's going to be a busy year next year. It's busier this year too. I'm actually writing my fifth novel this year. Five novels in one year. That's great. Yeah. And they're all, they're all about, it sounds like they're all 90 to 120, somewhere in that ballpark. Yeah, well, Ink, which I was the first novel I wrote this year, um, actually turned it in March, is about a hundred and, um, let's see, it's about 125,000 words. Okay. Um, Joe Ledger Relentless is 160,000 words. Okay. Three uh, times. Yeah. And then there's uh, Bewilderance, which is 97,000. And then I have a novel that I can't actually tell you the name of because it's a secret project we're about to announce. That's that's about 60,000 words. It's the shortest novel I've written. So you're closing on a, ha on a half million words written this year. Of yep. stuff. It's like actual projects that are coming out. Not counting short stories, articles, and graphic novels. Yeah. Cool, cool. And uh, let's see. We, what, what, <laughs> we're in the tail end here. Everybody seems like they've gotten all their questions answered in the room you have projects that you writing novel that you can't talk about how, how difficult is active as you are in social media. And you talk about projects at all phases of the work. You do a lot of interviews. You have a ton of authors onto your show all the time. How, is it difficult at all to keep that secret and keep it oh, from yeah. slipping up? There, there's a project I'm doing for DC comics. I want to tell everyone about, and I can't, mm -hmm. and there's a project I'm doing for Alcon entertainment. Um, who's launching a book line. Um, that's a prequel to one of their movies. And I, I can't talk about that either because non-disclosure agreements. And I probably even should, should have said it's a prequel to one of the movies. <laughs> but, um, Alcon. That's it. You're fired. Shen is at Alcon. But it's, um, uh, it, it, these are, these are things I'd love to talk about, but can't. And, uh, and by the way, somebody just posted a question. When will Lost Roads be on audiobook? It came out Friday of last oh, week. Wow. There you go. Read by Ray Porter. And how, is the, as from the business side of things, you're doing things that are now free, free on audible. So people with a paid audible subscription can get those without having to use a credit or pay for the download. I got um, paid. You got paid. Yes. Oh. How do you, do you, do you, is that more immediate access to your stuff? Is that impacting your career in any way? Are you seeing any benefit from that? Is it business as usual? Well, How yeah. I mean, oh. the, the reason I'm doing this, I did a story uh, some years ago. Um, my editor at, at uh, Audible asked me to write a short story um, that they wanted to give away for free to see if by giving something away for free, it would then encourage people to fo either follow that writer or follow the genre of that story. Mm -hmm. And they wanted me to ghost story. So I wrote a ghost story called Lullaby, which... They put up for free, and it became the number one short story on, on Audible for the year of 2018. Um, and not only did it, I mean, did we get a, like 100,000 downloads of the short story when it was free? Once they started selling it after the free period was over, which is about a month, it continued to sell, continued mm -hmm. to stay as the number one story. So I, I'm getting royalties on that still. So with the wilderness, it'll be free for probably until the third installment is out. Mm -hmm. And then eventually it, they'll, they'll be for sale and they prove the model. That's why now they have this thing on audible where if you're a subscriber, you get free, a bunch of free books that you can get the audible plus mm -hmm. program. My story of, uh, of lullaby was actually used to test drive that model. And it luckily it helped prove the model. And it's because it did is the reason audible came back to me to ask me to do this, um, uh, the science fiction trilogy. And how is, uh, how is Rosie these days? Rosie is fine. I was just playing with her right before this starts. Um, she's she's nine and a half now, and she's a happy little dog. And actually, one of my fans uh, did a carving of, of Rosie, wood carving of Rosie, 
with tentacles. She clearly just defeated. <laughs> so I think that's that's adorable. That's classic. That's classic. How often do you get to bring Rosie on uh, the the live streams? Uh, every once in a while, not often, because usually she's what I'm doing these. My wife usually takes Rosie out to the park or something, um, so I can have the house nice and quiet. But she's she's visited a few. She's even been on um, on my lap during one of the studio pitches for a TV show that we're, we're pitching um, via Zoom. Um, right. And uh, you know, she popped her head up a couple of times during one of those pitches. So I think the people at Amazon were quite amused. Is uh, with the last couple of minutes, is there anything else you want to share with people? Anything else you want to plug? Well, I mean, if if you if you guys haven't joined my live events every Thursday at four um, uh, Pacific time, I do a you know Facebook live. Uh, and if any if there are any writers out there, if you go to my webpage, JonathanMayberry.com, spell my last name right. It's M A B. Um, there's a whole sub page of free stuff for writers. Just grab whatever you want. Mm-hmm. But also, you know, um, there's one other thing we haven't talked about that, that is also a new release is, is that my first issue as full editor of Weird Tales came out uh, last week. And um, issue. Congratulations. Three. Thank you. And it's great cover by Lynn Hansen. Has stories by Weston Oaks, Shauna McGuire, um, Rena Mason, Weston, um, Dacre Stoker, who wrote an original Renfield story with his partner, Leverett Butts. And tons and tons of great writers and great stuff, but being the actual editor of Weird Tales is freakishly high on my bucket list. <laughs> and and so now I'm I'm actually doing that. That's really, really crazy nuts. Does that does that take a lot of time away from the original writing? Or is it uh, you able to compartmentalize that? Uh, I can compartmentalize. Luckily I, I multitask really well. Uh-huh. Uh, but you know I, I'm there are times I'm putting in 12, 14 hour days. But, you know, it's better than digging ditches, man. <laughs> it sure is. <laughs> Nobody's shooting at you. It's a good job. <laughs> you just get to create the imaginary bodies that go in the ditches instead. Yeah. Or imaginary. <laughs> <laughs> One has to Allegedly. do that, right? Allegedly imaginary as he takes a mysterious sip from his coffee cup. Yeah, but, um, <laughs> coffee, but, you know. Who knows? Well, it is getting towards that time where it is the end. Um, Scott, would you like to tell us what you have coming up? I also would love to hear what you have coming up as well. I I also have projects coming out with Audible. The next big one is Mount Fitzroy on December 3rd. It is a huge 225,000 word (laughs) hour audio book. It's a monster. That is book two in the Sun Symbol series. Book one is Earthcore. Earthcore is available in print. From Mysterious Galaxy, also available in audiobook. Both of those read by, were, Ray, read by Ray Porter. Earth Core Mount Fitzroy, both by Ray, read by Ray Porter. Uh, this is the first book I've done as an Audible original, so it'll be only available on Audible for a year, and we are very interested to see how that goes. Uh, mm-hmm. They're good people to be in business with right now. They really they understand the market very well. We're very excited about that. And of course, yeah. Aliens Phalanx, which was just out, which uh, I got that I got that deal, which is a dream come true to write an Aliens book. Thanks to Jonathan Mayberry, who made the connections with the people. Mm-hmm. So uh, that book, I think you guys still have copies of that too. People should, if you like, mm-hmm. want to see how the xenomorphs would fare in a medieval-esque culture, that is the book for you. Awesome. Awesome. And I know, okay, you guys have written an insane amount of books. And I mean that in the most flattering, awesome way possible because you guys are some of the hardest working authors that I know. So I know that we were talking about a lot of books. We have done our best where we had links being put up in the chat. We've also added more links um, and more book titles where if you click the buy sign book button where I've put more of the backstop for all of our authors as for all for these two gentlemen as well. So you can see it down there um, and they're signing instructions and everything on that page for you. And also too, as well, since we were talking about audiobooks and both of you guys have great audiobooks. Um, if you go on our webpage, Libro FM, actually links directly to our web page. So it will provide you audiobook links as well for that, which supports your indie locals, which is cool when that's an option as well. So I want to say thank you so much to Jonathan and happy book birthday to Ink, which sounds like just a phenomenally awesome story. It's just blood, ink, ghosts, things eating, memory, soul, just all the all the good things. All the good things. Story of the year. Um, you don't need to know how many horror movies we watched in this household to celebrate Halloween this year, then. But, <laughs> but, 
But thank you guys so much. It's always such a pleasure to have you guys. And thank you to all of the readers for joining us. Um, just oh, such a good book event. Go out and buy ink and all of the awesomeness. And we will see you guys on the next one. Have thank a good you. night, everybody. Thank you, Scott. Night, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.